Why is it so hard to recycle? That's that's been the longest, uh, I would say, uh, misconception on the topic of plastic, which is that the creators, the companies that really um, benefited from the mass commercialization of plastics, uh, they, you know, in in the 1990s, in the 1980s, when people started scrutinizing, you know, should we be creating so much throwaway material? Should 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 that be the lifestyle? Um, you know, there were campaigns rolled out um, to say that this this is actually a recyclable material. Um, this is guilt free. Don't worry about throwing it away. And then the entire recycling lo- symbols and everything things created. Um, the issue is that, you know, it's not that recycling doesn't exist. You know, today, about 10 percent of plastics do get recycled. But the issue that was that has never been talked about until relatively recently is that 90 percent is not being recycled. And that 90 percent is what's causing the problem. I'm Adam Vaughan. I'm the environment editor for The Times, and I'm very pleased today to be joined by Miranda Wang to talk about plastic. Um, Miranda, welcome. Hello. Hi, Adam. Thanks for having me. Miranda, just on brass tacks, just explain for people, it might seem obvious, but why is plastic bad for the environment? It's not necessarily that plastic is bad for the environment, but it's more how plastic as a systemic problem, um, how it is being produced and handled is bad for the environment. So if we begin with how it's produced, I mean, plastic is made from petro uh, fossil fuels, petrochemicals, and uh, the extraction of fossil fuels for making plastics is an extremely polluting and also uh, very intensive process, um, less so than when we mine for fuels, um, but still nonetheless polluting. Um, and the dis- discardment of plastic is even a bigger issue than the production of it, which is that when plastics today are finished their single-use life, a majority of plastics are designed to last a short amount of time for their actual commercial functions. Um, Most of it is being landfilled if you're in the U.S. And if you're in Europe, it is being incinerated because there's not enough land to be landfilled, which means that the carbon in the plastic is uh, emitted as CO2. So um, this is a a big problem on on many levels, not just on climate change, on the the physical pollution contamination of the environment. Um, But you mentioned earlier microplastics and how plastic as a material, it disintegrates very slowly, but it does not decompose like organic matter does. And so you end up having fragments of plastics in the environment that ends up harming natural wildlife. Got you. So it's not inherently evil, it's how we sort of manage the life cycle of it that's the issue. Uh, and, and, um, and what sort of, you know, we've been using plastic for more than a century. What sort of cumulative kind of impacts are we seeing from that you know in in, and i'm obviously not thinking in terms of how one you know you gets a coffee cup or whatever or plastic products in our life but in the wider environment what are the what sort of impacts are we seeing yeah i mean what you're seeing i think what initially caught everybody's attention is uh on social media, especially when this started spreading, is you see wildlife getting entangled and entrapped in plastic on the beaches. Turtles, you know, you see whales wash out with bellies full of plastic and they're not able to uh, eliminate that from their bodies and then they die. Um, That is, I would say, a very visceral, but a minority of where the plastics go. Um, If you go to places in the developing world, you will see that there are illegal or informal dumping sites across across the countries there, where for the past 30 plus years, um, Western nations, wealthier nations, have relied on the developing world as their landfill. Um, the the standard default way of recycling, if you will, for the longest time in places like California, um, has been you know over um, you know over 30 to 50 percent of the plastic in California that we um, our governments were classified diverted from landfill or recycled is actually just packaged up and sent over to, to China for the longest time, and in 2008. 18, you know, the Chinese government decided to ban the import of scrap plastic. 
Um, this is uh, something that's been long overdue. It used to have value when Western countries were less good at recovering valuable materials and plastic was a more valuable material. So it had actual recycling purpose and use in the developing world. But as plastic became more commoditized and in general cheaper and Western countries became better at extracting anything of value before sending the rest over, you know, it really just became outsourced, uh, you know, exported pollution. Um, so this is, you know, on a on a socioeconomic level, um, how much plastic pollution you see in the environment is a symbol of essentially the um, the, the overall um, disparity, um, y- you can say, of, of a community. Well, that's really interesting because, as you say, a lot of people might think about things like Blue Planet too, but the, the, you've, you've pointed out there the bigger sort of past the parcel issue that's going on. And uh, I think the UK, like you mentioned, California, UK also used to send a lot of waste to China and then started sending it to Turkey and Turkey said it didn't want it and now we're looking at other countries. Um, maybe we'll come back to that in a minute. But the why people you know, people might wonder sort of why is it really such a big issue? Why you know, isn't plastic relatively easy to recycle? Why is it so hard to recycle? That's that's been the longest uh, I would say uh, misconception on the topic of plastic, which is that the creators, the companies that really um, benefited from the mass commercialization of plastics, uh, they you know in in the 1990s, in the 1980s, when people started scrutinizing, you know, should we be creating so much throwaway material? Should 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 that be the lifestyle? Um, you know, there were campaigns rolled out um, to say that this this is actually a recyclable material. Um, this is guilt free. Don't worry about throwing it away. And then the entire recycling lo- symbols and everything is created. Um, the issue is that you know it's not that recycling doesn't exist. You know, today about ten percent of plastics do get recycled. But the issue that was that has never been talked about until relatively recently is that ninety percent is not being recycled, and that ninety percent is what's causing the problem. Yeah, that's a that's a really good way of. I'm sure there's certain people who love you to just focus on the ten percent. Um, that's um and and it, just explain. Uh, Miranda, just yeah, if we don't do something about this now, you know, you talked there about how much is not getting fixed. If we don't do something about this now, what challenges are we sort of storing up for the future? Because presumably, you know, population growth and affluence, you know, we're going to presumably end up using more plastic in the future. Yes, I mean that is the the direction in general. Is you know, plastic has become an inseparable part of our modern day lives. Um, everything from the things we absolutely need, like health, healthcare, and medical products, all the way through to things that enable our convenience, like being able to grab food on the way, you know, to the subway, etc. Um, it's very, very hard to get plastics out of our lives. In fact, we don't really have the right alternative materials. You cannot replace all the plastics in the world with paper, for example, or aluminum. There's just there's not enough resources to do so. Plastics are are very important in in the function they play. But if we continue handling them um, in such a linear life cycle, meaning that we make them, we use them, we throw them away, the way that we continue to act like out of out of sight, out of mind, um, then what we're going to be faced is, you I mean, you've, we've all seen Wally. Um, that that's the future, you know. The um, wealthier countries will, you know, be able to afford technologies to keep it out of sight as much as possible. But we're all going to be suffering. Um, in in poorer nations, this is, you know, more and more of their things. They're trying to, you know, pave the roads, everything out of plastic waste. But you're you're without new technologies that are able to properly in in new ways be able to make use of the plastic waste um, with ex- only existing technologies the most you can do is is try to incorporate some of that into some mechanical structures and the rest is going to be waste so it's it's a it's a big problem and it's not an easy one because it's not like there's just one type of plastic in the world mm. um, there you know the difference between a polyethylene plastic and a PVC is almost as if you're talking about paper to metal um, in mm. in some ways you know when when you're looking at what are when you're imagining what are the ways that you can repurpose it um, so it's something that I think is it requires a lot more attention, societal attention. Yeah, that's really interesting. To a good reminder that to not just think of it as one, you know, homogenous thing mm-hmm. when we talk about plastic. And I think that's a really interesting point as well. That you make about the inequity of it there as well. I don't think that's something many people might have thought about. Um, 
So look, I just want to, Miranda, we want to sort of cast things back a bit. And if you think back to when you were younger, I just want to get a sort of sense of how you got here. How You know, when do you sort of first, you know, I'm sure maybe your, your, your first interest in schooling wasn't like in plastic, but maybe in science more, an area of science more broadly. What What was your sort of... What were the beginnings of your interest? Yeah, I don't think that, you know, plastic is, is really a formal study <laughs> when when people are younger. Maybe it should be, you know, um, you know, modern materials and, and how we should uh, properly handle them, you know, in society. Uh, my, my interest has always been um, in the natural world and science. Um, that has always mattered to me. But at the same time, I've always been fairly well-rounded in uh, the humanities and in social studies as well. Um, and so I would say some of my first inroads with the plastic issue was was quite young. I um, was, when I was in, in um, elementary school, um, I had an opportunity actually to go on a year um, immersion experience in China uh, to the hometown my dad grew up in. And this is a small third tier uh, city that was actually a cold town not too long ago. And even in that environment, I, I was actually the person in charge of bringing the recycling of the classroom, you know, over to um, there were these, you know, informal collection sites were kind of like a depot, you know, they would give you a refund. Mm. Um, and I was the person kind of volunteer responsible for that because I, I just hated to see waste, you know, and nobody wanted to do the job. I didn't really understand. It seemed like they all felt like it was very un- unglamorous. You know, you wanted to be the class representative for the academic studies and, and not for <laughs> managing resources, and whatnot. Um, and then in high school, I um, actually met my current best friend uh, when we were in the recycling club together. At the time, it was the recycling club. Later, we when we took over the leadership of it, we rebranded the environment club, and we ended up realizing we were the wealthiest club in, in the school because of all the the money from the recycling um, that we had, you know, collected over the past ten years before we were even there. And invested the money into building an organic veg- vegetable garden for the school, and and so my you know my interests have always been very um, community oriented. And I'm very fascinated mm. by kind of the relationship of humans with their materials. Um, it's uh it's really strange to me, <laughs> you know, why people look down on trash and those who work with it, because not too long ago the stuff that was in the trash was valuable goods that we spend a lot of money, uh, we make a big deal out of. <laughs> so that's very interesting to me. So it goes a long way back, and, and, and so tell me about your company Nova Loop. What is it, and how did that come about? So uh, Novaloop is a venture-backed startup. We're based here in California, and we're really focused on creating the plastic circular economy, especially for plastics that are really hard to recycle today. So I mentioned 90% of plastics that are produced there are not recycled or not, not really even recyclable. There are no markets to absorb that, that product, that waste material. So we're addressing that 90%. And we're developing new chemical technologies to be able to transform that plastic waste into high performance, high value materials um, and to do so in a way that's economical so that there's no price difference between our products and also versus the products that people are currently using in those categories. Just remind people what circular economy means. Miranda. So a circular economy is a bit of an emerging term here, but it's the the vision for the future where um, in the world of plastics, instead of we make, we use and we discard, we kind of bury it like it's dead. Right. Uh, Instead, it's a cycle, just like how you would have with organic materials. You would make it, use it and then you would cycle it. You would cycle it so that um, at the end, the waste material is also the the raw material um, for for a new lifespan. Um, and so circular is really the model that allows us to solve this problem and get ourselves, you know, to reach the compromise, if you will, where we can use these uh, modern materials without destroying the planet. Got you. And just on definitions, so you're basically doing upcycling here, I think. What, 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 just explain what that means because people might just think it was just recycling. Yeah. So in um, recycling, the idea is, you know, you're, you're turning something back into the sim- similar thing. Like you're taking a shopping bag, you're somehow making a shopping bag again. Maybe it's not 100% the old shopping bag. There's mm-hmm. only 20% of the old shopping bag in it, 80% yeah. brand new stuff. But that's like the idea of recycling. 
Downcycling is if you take, um, you know, say a plastic bag, instead of making the same thing again, you're making a lower value thing. Maybe you're turning it into fuel and then you're burning it in one use and it becomes CO2 and it's a dirty mm -hmm. fuel. Um, and so that's an example of downcycling. It's downcycled because you get less value at the end mm -hmm. of the day. And there are also other consequences. Um, upcycling is when you're taking, say, for example, that shopping bag again. Like what Novaloop is doing through our technology, we can transform that shopping bag into a high performance material that can be used to build uh, running shoes. And so that material can be used over and over again um, over the course of years um, and enable, you know, it, an athlete to be able to to, you know, do the things that they, they want to do. Um, and what's also important is that the performance of this material. So our first product is a rubber like um, elastomer called uh, thermoplastic polyurethane. And so so TPU, so this material that we make out of shopping bags, if you will, is um, a completely different material at the end of the day. It's worth 70 times more than the, the material we start with and also has the same quality as the comparable TPUs that are made from fossil fuels. Um, so that's an example of, of upcycling. Sometimes people might yeah. also use that term to say, you know, we use a bunch of shopping bags, we melted them and we made a beautiful piece of furniture or art. Yeah. And just explain, <clears throat> I think when you initially were setting out, you were looking at like using bacteria to do this. It's just explain in layman's language what the sort of process for how you do this, the, the chemistry of it. Yeah. So uh, we came to where, you know, our current technology, um, I would say there was definitely a journey to get here. Um, the initial idea was to look at, are there ways to biodegrade plastics? I mean, in nature, organics are cycled because we have bacteria and fungi and detrivores, right? And so um, I was always interested in, could, you know, could there be bacteria that have evolved in highly contaminated mm -hmm. places to be able to essentially eat and break, break down the plastics on a biochemical level? Um, and so that was my initial in, I would say, on the scientific perspective for on the plastic problem. But as we started working on this more, we realized that, you know, um, there's a reason why there's plastic pollution out in the environment. If you leave it there, it doesn't just rot and go away. It's because bacteria are not able to effectively break it down. Um, if you rely on biochemistry because plastics are solid, you know, you need things that are more soluble to properly, you know, be, be biodegraded. It's also a man-made synthetic structure, molecular structure that bacteria are not really well adapted to consuming. It's so it's so carbon rich, you know, mm. um, it's just very, very slow. And so what we ended up doing is saying, well, if we look at um, the industrial chemistry, all the, the years of knowledge on how to scale that, um, it's just a much more scalable and fast approach to actually look at, you know, are there oxidation, oxidative approaches, which is similar to what the bacteria, the biochemistry was, but can we oxidize the plastics using pure chemistry um, and, and be able to achieve the efficiencies needed to deal with the quantities we have? Oh, yeah, that's really helpful. And I just want to get, let's get into some plastic acronym soup. Um, can you explain to people the difference between low density, low density polyethylene or LDPE and most recycled plastics, such as like, obviously the, one of the most recycled ones is PET used in drink bottles and HDPE in milk bottles and yogurt pots. Just explain some of the differences. I think you're focusing on breaking down LDPE. <laughs> just explain the difference. Yeah, so Novalub is focused on any kind of polyethylene. Um, so, like I mentioned, there there are many kinds of plastics, and and the nomenclature for plastics is really based on what is uh, the, the the structure of it, right? So. Um, if you have polyethylene, it just means many ethylenes. Um, so it's made by ethylene gas being put together into a long chain. If it's polypropylene, it just means many propylenes um, and it's put together. Um, PET is actually two subunits, polyethylene terephthalate. So you have terephthalic acid in it. So you have AB and that just keeps repeating AB, 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 etc. Um, and so 
that kind of explains the weird names um, and the, the, the abbreviations, you know, PE is just for polyethylene. And then they add on the densities, which is just simply how dense, uh, densely are you layering those, the, are you stacking those, those you know, those long polymer chains um, when you're creating that, that plastic um, material, that resin. And so um, there are many densities of polyethylene. There's low density, linear, de- l- linear low density, high density, cross-links polyethylene. There's just many kinds. Um, and so, you know, in, in our case, we actually focus on any kind of polyethylene. Um, you know, we, we're more particular to how that actual structure is built. Um, and then there are some companies, for example, that are specializing in PET. Um, companies are specializing in, in polypropylene. Um, and, and, and there's an entire ecosystem of us that's, that's em- emerging together. Mm. And just, uh, I mean, just just to sort of simplify that a little bit, what what are you adding? What are you bringing that is not there? That's not wasn't being done before. Yeah. So what we're doing um, is that we're we're first of all using polyethylene, which has been extremely hard to break down. So low density polyethylene, the stuff that makes shopping bags, for example. There's only about a five percent recycling rate of that. Um, when it's post-consumer, it means a consumer has used it, um, versus post-industrial means it only stayed at the factory where it's being manufactured. So post-consumer low-density polyethylene, um, there's only about five percent recycling rate for that in the U.S. Um, High-density polyethylene post-consumer, there's about ten percent that's being recycled. So for us, we're, we're focusing on that, those majorities of it that's not being recycled, um, and how we're how what we're doing differently. You know, there's reason those are not being recycled more is because there's not enough technical methods um, to create valuable enough products that people want to buy. Um, mm. and so, you know, they've sort of maxed the economics out. Of it don't make, the economics of it don't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's based on the ac- economics of it. I mean, if, if they could use current mechanical recycling means, which means they shred the plastic, they wash it, they melt it. And if, if that can make good enough quality stuff, then more people would buy it and you would have a higher recycling rate. But the issue is plastic is limited. When you uh, shred and and wash and melt it, you get a poor quality product. You get a downcycled product in that second generation. And so to be able to even make a shopping bag from an old shopping bag, you can only use sometimes only up to 20 or 30 percent of that old bag. Otherwise, the, thing, the new bag would just simply not hold together. It would just fall apart. Um, and so what we are doing is we're, we're taking – the polyethylenes that other people really struggle to take because maybe it's too contaminated, it's colored, um, maybe it has, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, when contamination, there's many different kinds. <laughs> and so so yeah. there's there's a lot of problems with it. And what we do that's unique is we chemically break it down. Um, we cr- turn it into basic building blocks, chemical building blocks, and we create new products out of it. And so in this way, we essentially create a new new channel or new outlet to turn the polyethylenes that are stuck into valuable products that are marketable. Yeah, that makes that's really helpful. So that that sort of chemical upcycling you've just talked about just sounds great, but the, what what there must be some issues. What you know is is there issues around costs, around how environmentally benign it is. What's what are the issues? Yeah, so we we have been very um, careful about that because it's very important to create um, you know a chemical upcycling technology that's not just making a, a decent product at the end. Um, the product has to be economical. People need to want to buy it. They need to be able to afford it. Um, and the whole process has to be sustainable, has to be better than the status quo, uh, whether it's how that end product is being made today, which is at, at our in our in our category, it's made from fossil fuels. We're competing against those guys and we're about 30 percent better um, in less than CO2 footprint. Um, or, you know, they're looking at other things. For example, you know, the feedstock that you're using, are you using something that other people would buy anyway because it's actually recyclable or are you Using something that is en route to the landfill or to the incinerator. And if it's from the incinerator, you get even more CO2 avoidance because, uh, you know, it would directly be put up in the air as opposed to be more kind of long term stored. Um, and so these are these are things that are all very important to us. And we're at the point where we have this core technology. We have a path to a product. The product's been validated with sports companies. Um, and the entire process is now demonstrated by third-party life cycle assessment 
to be better than the status quo. And so what we're what we're doing now, the biggest challenge here is the scale up. Um, we're, yeah. we're bringing this technology from something that is, you know, in the labs at the pilot scales now into a commercial scale. Um, and and we're in this last phase, you know, essentially of de-risking the technology of creating the engineering designs for this first chemical plant. And when do you hope to when do you hope to get there? When might this sort of commercial stage come? So our our timeline right now is you know end of this year we will have the um you know the the I would say the bis- preliminary plans for this first project, um, and next year we will be in full mode fundraising for it, really working the partners to orchestrate and put it in motion. Usually it takes about two years to build a plant like this. Got you. And and you talked earlier about this sort of so-called circular economy idea concept. And at the moment you're dealing with sort of products that, you know, people are putting out there already. How much, you know, how much easier would it might it be if companies when they're designing products start thinking at the outset about the fact that there might be the possibility of breaking them down into their chemical components? You know, what how might we do you know, I suppose what I'm asking is, you know, how could society sort of design things better so that mm-hmm. It's easier for people like yourself to, you know, enable them to be reused. Yeah, I, I think following kind of the rule of simplicity is is, is helpful. So, um, you know, when you have a plastic water bottle, the bottle itself is PET, the cap is HDP, and then the wrap on around it with the label that's yeah. actually a multi layer material with. PT, LDP, EVOH, there's like a whole, whole bunch of stuff. So um, I think the, the rule of simplicity, the thing is it's designed that way for purpose, is so that the water Perf- can be kept. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but can we rethink so that the whole bottle is literally just one material? Um, that means the whole thing can be recycled. Because right now, even when a water bottle gets to a, gets to a recycling plant, gets a sorting, a waste sorting plant, the bottle caps never get recycled um, because the the people who are buying the bottles, they just want the body of it. They just want the PET. And, yeah. the, you know, so so you have a lot of these issues because it's, it's poor planning, I, I would say, or, or just limitations due to, um, you know, performance expectations only being able to be met by that type of design. Um, there's that. But, you know, designers also have their hands tied in a way. Right. Because. They only have the library materials that they have to choose from. <laughs> and so if those materials themselves are inherently challenged in how they can be reused and repurposed later, like I mentioned, polyethylene has these problems, right, where it mechanically gets downcycled, then then what else are they supposed to use? You know, industrial designers can only use things that are commercially available, right? I mean, otherwise they would design some prototypes that that could never become mass commercialized into bottles that everyone can use, right? So, so um, this is a this is an ecosystem issue. It's not just something we can design out. Got you. And just coming back to your technology, people might be thinking, well, why have we not done this before? Why is why is this coming of age now? Um. So there. It's been it's been uh, stalled, I would say, for the longest time, because um, for the longest time, very few people were aware of what was really going on. Um, you know, we, we really brushed this problem under the rug and said that we we're recycling. Um, you know, in fact, uh, my local uh, jurisdiction says the recycling rate is over 90 <laughs> percent. And so but, you know, that's just that just means they're not landfilling over 90 percent of the stuff that's going to the, the you know, household recycling bin in the local landfill. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're really recycling all of it. Right. They don't really know what happens to it once the bale gets taken out of the of the sorting plant. So so. When we don't have full traceability from, you know, the point where waste gets collected all the way through to what happens, when there's lack of full traceability, we as a society have a hard time finding faults in the existing system. Um, And so that's why it took so many years um, until it, it just became you know, completely broken, you know, by China saying they don't want to take any more of this and everyone having nowhere to put it. So it was stockpiled and this became an entire crash in that market, in that commodity market. Um, you know, I, I would say it's it's a lot of it is is ignorance, but it's not ignorance because people are naive. It's, it's ignorance because mm. it's really a hard problem that if you point a finger to it, you better have a solution. And it's not a it's not an issue that any policymaker can solve on their own. This this is a systemic mm. issue that needs new technologies. And, and talking of those technologies, what, what sort of, you know, so once you've managed to break things down, what sort of products are you 
upcycling them to? What's like a couple of examples? Yeah, so um, we, uh, I mentioned, you know, we take polyethylenes. So that can be anything from shampoo bottles, laundry detergent bottles. Some of those already have some mechanical recycling markets. Um, but it can also be low-density polyethylenes. We mentioned shopping bags, but it can be, you know, there, there's a whole lot of other things, like the bags you get for, in your cereal to, yeah. you know, the saran wrap. All that, film, all that to, filmy type all, stuff. All right? that yeah, film yeah. stuff, all that film, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. anything that wraps, you know, some sort of yeah, product. Yeah. Products. Um, so, um, and also you can look at a larger scale, construction plastic, a lot of plastic used to mask, you know, something when you're painting it, or also pallet wrap, um, things that are protecting, yeah. you know, you know, you might not see it as a consumer, but it's in the back of that cafeteria, you know, that you're, you're dining yeah. in. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff in the world that's, that's polyethylene. Um, and then, so we use that as our starting material. And the product that we make, um, so we actually have a platform technology where by uh, decomposing or oxidizing the polyethylene, we create a suite of uh, chemical intermediates or chemical building blocks. And and these chemical intermediates can be used to make actually a whole variety of platform of products. The first category we're focusing on is polyurethane. So polyurethane is a very useful set of performance materials. You have materials in that category ranging from what your memory foam mattress, literally the whole block is, all the way to the material that's in the insulation of your walls to keep your building warm um, to the material that's used to make your running shoe. You know, Adidas actually made um, an entire running shoe called the Loop Shoe that's all TPU. So, you know, that was interesting because it was kind of a demonstration that if anyone's only going to make a shoe out of one material, they actually chose mm. TPU because of all its performance and, and comfort features. Plus, you've got my attention now because I'm a runner, so now you've got me <laughs> excited about it. Right. Um, and what sort of stuff could you make in the future, do you think? You know, you mentioned you gave a few examples there. Is there, you know, what other sort of applications? Yeah, we um we we see a lot of <laughs> we see a lot of applications, um you know altogether you know I think when we came down and started calculating what that could mean in market size, the number came out to be one hundred forty billion dollars in total addressable markets, and these are this is the value of the markets for products we can make by digesting polyethylene <laughs> from from this new technology. Um, there's lots of things, everything from paints to um, to biodegradable materials, to new materials that maybe don't exist today that could be created um, and, and introduced into markets. So, and, and that's an interesting challenge, right? Because we need to then sit down and say, okay, so we have this, this pathway to go from existing materials that's creating huge volumes that's getting created more and, and few people really, you know, have outlets for it. We create a new outlet for it. But what do we turn it into? If we're going to make new things out of it, how do we what do we how do we decide whether we should be making those things whether that's a good idea for the world um and so this is all very interesting you know but i think this is you know a way for companies like novalub to lead the world into the future is you know to, for us to get there we only have what we have today right we have these mm, yeah. these mass commoditized materials they're has to be a path to get to the future, which is in the future, we're going to have pro probably a bunch of different materials, but they're all fully circular. And we abandon some of these older ones, but there is a journey to get there. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, and, and so I think in 2019, you were announced as this Rolex laureate at the Awards for Enterprise. Um, I mean, how has that sort of recognition helped you? You know, you were talking, talking earlier about the need to scale up. How has that helped you scale up? So I, I think the Rolex um, community has just been, first of all, um, a very impressive group. I mean, you have people who are explorers, who are top scientists in their fields, and, and, and people like me, you know, who are trying to build a business that also does good for the world. Um, and when you have a whole group of people like this, what you notice, the common thread, is that there's just a... a this, this abundance of optimism. I mean, there's so much we can do with our time here to reverse the problems, um, to lead everybody into the future. Um, and so I think, uh, the you know, one of the biggest benefits of being part of this community has been, um, you know, connecting with others who are like-minded, seeing the connections between all these issues from the natural world to the industrial problems. Um, and also at the same time, having this platform where I can, you know, speak to people like you and the audience here, you know, about the problems that, that we're dealing with and um, maybe not be so well educated about yet. 
Well, that's really interesting. And, and, and on the, the awards obviously been helpful for you, but I mean, how? what's your sort of sense of how the, the award for enterprise stuff has helped other environmental experts elsewhere? Well, in, in some communities, you know, with the size of the grant, um, it's actually able to completely transform, you know, on a, on a certain issue. Um, I mean, we have in, in my cohort, um, we have people who are working on uh, restoring an entire species, for example, in the in the Amazon. Um, we have, you know, people who are working on uh, trying to save forests um, from from deforestation through through technology. It's just it's just so fascinating, you know, um, all the things that people are doing and how by injecting this type of, um, you know, in this case, this is through the foundation is really philanthropic money here, right? How mm. injection of this kind of funding can go a long way um, to to create a focal point in these communities, um, so people actually have real activities and 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 organizations built around it. Um, it's it's it makes this is the sort of thing that makes a difference. Okay, great. And, and so looking forward, Miranda, we've been talking. I mean, you know, we've been talking a lot about recycling, and you know, people were sort of. You know, people listening might think, I just want plastic pollution fixed. And, and obviously recycling is, uh, upcycling, as we've been talking, I should say more more correctly, is one part of it. I mean, we, we also, you know, from the experts I've sort of spoken to in the past, it's clear that in this treaty that's being negotiated globally, if we don't do something about the demand for plastic as well, then we're never going to fix this problem, are we? Yes, um, that's a tricky one. <laughs> That's a tricky one because it's it's almost the same as the carbon problem, right? Um, why is it that you know wealthy nations have gotten to this point because they've been able to create all this waste? Um, why is it that for the emerging nations that are going to be rising in in the future, why is it that they can't do it with these modern materials? Um, you know, it, it's just it's very, it's very challenging. Um, but we do need to curb demand because. The um, this deficit between, you know, um, if you if you look at what's called the circularity gap, which is how much material we projected to produce versus how much of it we can truly recycle, even with our existing technology, even if we do it much better and we really push it, that gap is significant. Um, and even if you layer on new technologies like the ones Novaloop is developing, we still will have a gap. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. the only way you can close it is through reduction. And some of the reduction is going to come from um, some systemic changes. You know, you're looking at, for example, some systems in um, localized communities where it might, might make sense, where instead of having a single use sort of throwaway system, you have reverse logistics. You're recycling a Tupperware you're, or you are, you know, taking a, a product, physical product back and you are you're recycling it so that 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 material never ends up in the landfill or need to go to the landfill. Um, these are things that will make a big impact um, and the overall reduction of, of, you know, of stuff in general, you know, build better stuff, think through it more when you build it. And as a consumer, don't attach your personal worth with just the stuff you have, you know, um, and it, it matters a lot more. It's not just how many things you have, but how 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 much quality is in those things um, and how good are they? How much does it make sense with the era that we live in? Um, these are all things we need to consider. So I'm sure you wouldn't argue, obviously, that it's a silver bullet for our plastic waste problem but what sort of if it all goes swimmingly and according to plan Miranda what sort of dent can it make in the sort of plastic waste issue we have yeah so with these calculations um you need to have a little bit it's more see it as like the boundaries of the ranges um it, it depends a lot on the products we make how marketable it is right but um based on kind of my on the napkin calculation that I did once um so for polyethylene category, which is a third of all the plastics out there, um, with our technology, we can address somewhere around 25 percent of that. Um, and to go beyond that, it's possible, but it requires even more infrastructural investment and, and new innovation. So it can make a significant dent. It's not going to solve the whole problem. It's a big chunk of the pie, though, if you can do a quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just sort of zooming like right out, Miranda, just looking beyond just plastics, you know, looking at the state of the environment globally, a bit more broadly, how hopeful are you, you know, as, as a species that will get a handle on, you know, you touched on carbon emissions earlier on, we've been talking obviously about, about plastic pollution. How hopeful are you? Um, 
you know, for, for me, it's not, I actually don't work really hard every day. Thinking is like, I have, I do this because I have so much hope. Um, it's more that I feel like there's no choice. Like, you know, in every generation, there's a doomsday thing. You know, there's always something we think is going to end the future. Um, and, and that's one of the different differences between humans and other species is that we can see the threats. Um, and, and we are seeing it now, which is actually, to me, excellent news. Um, and so it's, it's more of a fact of um, how much can we, can we do? How much can, alignment can we reach around the world? to get to, because there's so many things that we already have solutions for, that we have resources to do, but we we don't have infinite resources at all. And so it's, it's more that, um, it's not so much of a hope, it's, it's a dial, right? <laughs> Sometimes it is, a, it feels like a bit of a luck. The system is so big here, you know, this, this, this global, you know, community that we have. Um, and there are a lot of people who are not interested in getting along with each other, which, mm. you know, clearly is, is just going the wrong direction here. Um, but, you know, I, when I when, when you ask me, you know, what gives me hope, I, I see it really as as necessity. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think as, as humans, you, you have to have some belief that there is the future, um, that that you will continue being part of the future or your your children, your descendants. Um, if, if you don't have that view, then that I think that goes against our, our basic human nature, which I know some people nowadays say, you know, they don't want to have kids because the future is so bleak. Um, but think about, you know, if you don't have a future, if you don't invest in that and work toward that, then you're you're definitely going to have a bad ending. It's it's kind of like, you know, you have to continue to not lose for sure. Um, it's, it's an ongoing struggle, right? Um, that's that's just what life is. That's great. Uh, that's a super note to end on. Thank you so much for your time, Miranda. Thank you. <laughs>